Hello, friend. Welcome to T-Core and Chill. Today we have a special curated video all about metal foundries for you today. And it's everything we've ever learned in here in T-Core, the ins and outs and everything you ever need to know. So I feel like we should get into it now. Enjoy. Let's start this project with a big bag of play sand and some plaster of Paris, both of which you can find at your local hardware store for under $20. We're also going to need a 10-quart steel bucket and a tablecloth to cover anything important because chances are this is going to get a bit messy. I found that this 2.5-quart bucket can be used for measuring the ingredients, but it also serves a more important purpose that you'll see in just a second. Now the recipe I'm using for this makeshift refractory lining is 1 and 3 quarter buckets full of plaster of Paris, 1 and 3 quarter buckets full of sand, and 1 and 1 quarter buckets filled with water. The moment the water touches the dry mix, the clock starts ticking and we've only got about 15 minutes before it all hardens up. So let's get busy mixing everything together. It's really important to get all the dry powder wet and work out any lumps as quickly as possible. And after mixing for a couple of minutes, it should be fairly runny and roughly all the same color. Now when you're convinced there aren't any lumps of powder left in the bucket, the refractory mix is ready for pouring. So let's carefully transfer it to the steel bucket as slowly as practical to minimize the splattering. There should be just enough fluid to fill the bucket about 3 inches from the top, and now if we bring back our plastic measuring bucket, we can use it to form the center of the foundry. I filled my bucket with water to give it a bit of weight, but anything like sand or rocks will work as well. And you can see that as we push the bucket into the center, the mixture rises upward, but it doesn't spill out. Now it's obvious that the mix is already starting to firm up, so let's try working the bucket up and down a few times to help level it before it sets. All we have to do now is hold still for 2-3 to three minutes. This will give the plaster just enough time to harden so the bucket stays in place even when we let go. Alright, time for a little cleanup. Everything will still need about an hour to really harden up, but the plaster is still soft enough that we can clean and shape it to look really good. And while we're here, we may as well wipe the bucket down as well. Now I found that if we dampen a rag and gently drag it around the top, the surface cleans up really nicely and gets a cool texture in the process. When it looks the way you want it to, simply leave it for about an hour. Now while we're waiting, why don't we turn this old steel fire extinguisher into a custom crucible. You can tell it's made from steel because when we hold a magnet to it, it sticks. And magnets won't do that with aluminum. I depressurized the tank and unscrewed the valve from the top to make it safe and easy to cut in half with a hacksaw, which you can see just happened in less than a minute. Now the bottom part of the extinguisher is what we want for the crucible, because it's basically a steel cup 3 inches in diameter and 5 inches tall. That's going to be the perfect size for our custom backyard foundry. At this point, the plaster should be pretty well set, so let's dump the water from the bucket, then use something like a pair of channel locks to grip one edge of the pail and pull gently toward the center. Now if we grip it with both hands and give it a bit of a twist, you can see the whole bucket pops loose and pulls right out. This just created an amazingly smooth surface, which gives this makeshift foundry a surprisingly professional look. The only features we're missing now are an air supply port and a lid, so let's make those next. Now I found that a 1 and 3 8 inch hole saw was the perfect size for accommodating this 1 inch steel tubing. And if we center the metal cutting blade with the top line on the bucket, we can carefully begin cutting through the metal wall. Once we're through the metal, it's easy to burrow down at about a 30 degree angle because the plaster hasn't fully cured yet and it cuts away like butter. Now we have a tight downward sloping hole that the blower tube fits perfectly into and it's strategically placed a few inches up from the bottom. This way, if a crucible fails and dumps molten metal into the foundry, it'll stay in the foundry instead of dangerously flowing out of the pipe. Now the blower tube is really easy to make and starts with a 1 inch steel pipe like this. This is the business end that'll sit next to the hot coals in the foundry. We're also going to need a 1 inch PVC coupling as well as some 1 inch PVC pipe. You can see the threads on one half of the coupling screw onto the steel pipe and the slip adapter on the other end simply pushes onto the PVC tube. It's that easy. Now let's go one step further and make a lid to help retain the heat. I got a couple of 4 inch U-bolts from the hardware store and stood them upright in a 5 quart big mouth bucket filled with a half measure of our insulating mix. After an hour you can see the plaster is set and the whole thing pops free from the bucket giving us a nice little custom lid for the foundry. It still needs a vent hole for relieving pressure buildup and you could just form one when you're casting it or you could try drilling one with a 3 inch hole cutting saw like this. With a hole in the center, you can see we end up with a nice thick lid that kind of looks like a giant white donut. This design works great for venting pressure and gives us the option to melt metal as well without even having to take the lid off the furnace. Just for fun, I picked up a can of burnished amber spray paint and gave the foundry a couple coatings to make it look a little more attractive. If we get it fired up, you can see the mini foundry gets so hot on the inside that it'll melt soda cans within seconds and fill a crucible with liquid aluminum. Look for how to do that in another project video. 
With this homemade furnace, we have the power to liquefy aluminum in the backyard and cast just about any object we can think of. The best part is, when you're not melting scrap metals, rather than taking up space and looking terrible, you can drop in a plant and instantly transform it into fashionable home decor. With this transforming flower pot foundry, there's certainly more than meets the eye. And by the way, if you run out of soda cans to melt, you could try using it as a blacksmithing forge or even a barbecue for summertime grilling. After all, it is fueled by charcoal briquettes. Well, now you know how to use commonly available materials to build the mini metal foundry. Powerful enough to melt metal in seconds, but still pleasant enough to keep around for decoration. Hey, what's up guys? Today I'm out here with my mini metal foundry because we're celebrating a milestone. The video on melting pop cans has reached over 13 and a half million views and over 100,000 likes. Now, when I first made the metal foundry, I had no idea that so many of you would actually be making this yourselves. And as a result, a lot of you have had questions and concerns and left comments about failures and mistakes that have been made. And I wanted to update you through this video about some of the personal tips and tricks that I've started using that may solve those problems for you. The mini metal foundry is made of some very basic materials. It's just a steel bucket with a little bit of sand, some plaster of Paris, and some water to create just enough of an insulating layer that you can heat up and melt metals like aluminum, brass, and even silver and gold. Okay, now some people would like to know why did I design the metal foundry out of sand and plaster when I could have used refractory cement, kale wool, or other higher quality refractory materials like that? And the answer is simple. When I designed the metal foundry, I wanted it to be relatable. I wanted most people to be able to go out and buy simple, commonly available materials and put together a backyard foundry that would work. Now along with that, using cheaper materials means that the system is going to break down a little bit faster. And one of the most common pieces of feedback I've had from people is that after two or three firings, the lid starts to crack and crumble and break. And that's not just you guys, that happens to me as well. But I figured out a cool little trick you can do that'll make it last about 10 times longer and all you need is a little bit of steel wool. I went down to the hardware store and found some of the coarsest steel wool I could get. And when you unravel the bundle, you can see it rolls out into long strands of steel, which is kind of like a metal spider web. And the idea is to push this down into the plaster and sand mix while it's still wet because this metal mesh will help reinforce the sand and the plaster and hold everything together about 10 times longer than it would without it. If you want to get even more mileage out of your metal foundry, then try using stainless steel strands instead of the steel wool. You can get stainless steel strands in things like Brillo pads, which are going to be a lot more expensive, but it should hold up a lot longer in the same kind of conditions. Another one of the benefits of the metal foundry is it's very easy to remake. Over time, the walls will start crumbling, but you can just bang all that crud out with a hammer and mix up a new batch, and in 20 minutes, you've got yourself a brand new system. A bag of plaster and a bag of sand together will cost about $20, but the cool thing is you can make between two and three metal foundries with it. Now some people wonder if you can use cement or concrete instead of plaster of Paris, and I would strongly caution you not to. The reason is, is if there's any moisture trapped in the concrete, then when it heats up, there's the potential it could explode in your face. On the other hand, plaster of Paris and sand are very porous, so they vent the gases off, and there's very, very low risk of that happening at all. Now the foundry will reach temperatures up around 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, and I know that because it'll melt copper. And if it can melt copper, it'll melt silver and gold as well, but it probably won't melt steel. Steel has a melting point up around 2300 to 2400 degrees Fahrenheit, so you might be able to use the metal foundry to help you forge steel, but you're not gonna be able to melt it down and cast with it. Okay, let's talk about crucibles. Now, I used a fire extinguisher for my crucible, and that was mainly just to show that it could be done in an apocalyptic situation. I certainly wasn't recommending that a fire extinguisher was the best way to go, but it's blown my mind how many comments and questions I got from people asking where to get fire extinguishers, or that they bought a fire extinguisher only to find out that it melted in the foundry. So let's address that issue first. First of all, if your fire extinguisher is melting in the foundry, it's not made of steel. Remember, a magnet will stick to steel, but it won't stick to aluminum. So if you wanna know if your fire extinguisher is made of steel or aluminum, Touch a magnet onto the edge and see if it sticks. I got mine used from an industrial equipment supplier, but that's not gonna be the typical story for you. By far, by far, by far, by far, the best crucible I've ever used is called a clay graphite crucible, and it's one that I found off the internet for about $30 to $40. Now, it seems like a little bit of investment, but trust me, a fire extinguisher isn't gonna be any cheaper, and the clay graphite crucible is gonna last a lot longer. I've personally put mine through over 30 different firings, and it has taken a lot of abuse. You can see it's vitrified and almost like turned to glass on the edges, but I put this thing through thermal shock. I heat it up, I cool it down, I heat it up, I cool it down, I heat it up and cool it down again and it just keeps going and going. I even cracked the side of it once but it seemed to just heal itself. So a clay graphite crucible is probably what you want to go for. And I'll put a link in the description to one I found on Amazon that I think would be a good recommendation for you. Now when it comes to making ingots, I've made all kinds of different shapes, sizes, and styles, but definitely by far my favorite are the mini metal muffins. These ones are my very favorite because they're extremely easy to store, they're very easy to melt, and they'll almost fit any size crucible. If you make some of the bigger muffins, you're going to need a much bigger crucible to melt them back down, and it's going to take a lot longer to do. Now let's talk about charcoal. Not all charcoals are created equal. The charcoal I used for my first firings was the Kingsford charcoal, which is used for barbecuing. There are ingredients in there like lime, which is specifically designed to make the coals burn at a 
lower temperature so they last longer. So if you ever switch over to something like lump charcoal, which is basically just pyrolyzed wood, you're gonna find a massive difference in the way it operates. The first thing I noticed about lump charcoal is it emits a shower of sparks. So you definitely wanna make sure you're wearing long sleeves or you're gonna end up with little sparks burning your arms. The other thing is, is it burns a lot hotter. In the early days, I had one of my steel fire extinguisher crucibles in there and it actually got so hot that it melted the steel and all the aluminum leaked out. So if you use lump charcoal, it'll burn a lot hotter. It's very, very powerful stuff, but you need to watch it more carefully. Use a lower setting on your hair dryer. You don't need to be pumping that much air into it to get the same temperatures. If you're still using charcoal, to melt your metals, then as soon as you turn the hair dryer off, pull the tube out of the metal foundry. If you leave the tube in the foundry with no air blowing, the heat's gonna travel up that tube and melt your hair dryer, and you're gonna end up having to get a new one. Now, if you made the switch to the propane conversion, congratulations, I hope it's working well for you. But there are some things that you should know. Like, if you run the propane tank for more than about 25 minutes, it's gonna start getting really, really cold. It may start to sound like the gas is running out, but really what's happening is your propane cylinder is starting to freeze up. A couple of ways you can battle that is to get a big bucket of warm water and just dump your propane propane tank down into it to help warm it back up again, or just get a bigger propane tank that will take longer to freeze. Now I want to talk for a second about styrofoam casting. I did styrofoam casting in my previous tutorials because I think that's the simplest method to get started in casting. But it doesn't always yield the cleanest results. It's a trial and error, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It blows me away that this concept even works at all, that you can just bury styrofoam in sand, pour molten metal and pull out a casting that looks almost identical. But the surface is going to be rough and sometimes the sand collapses and you lose your entire project. Another thing you need to consider when styrofoam casting is that styrofoam can bend. So when you're adding your model to a bucket of sand, you need to be very careful about how you add the sand because putting too much pressure on it can bend the mold and then when you cast it, it's gonna come out looking funny. Now, if you wanna pull the most value and the most detail from your styrofoam castings as possible, it does make a difference what kind of sand you use. Regular play sand will work great, but if you want even more detail, you can go to the pet store and get aquarium sand, which is extremely, extremely fine sand. That'll just be able to get into all the nooks and crannies a lot better and help your casting come out looking really crisp. I've worked with very, very wet sand all the way to extremely dry sand and I haven't noticed much of a difference between them. Some people wonder how long should they let their foundry cure before they use it and honestly I don't really think it matters. I use mine the same day I make it and it seems to work just fine. One other disadvantage to styrofoam casting is that as you pour quite often sand will fall into that molten mix which will contaminate the purity of your metal. So even if you try and buff it up sanding it and spend a lot of time you're gonna notice little specks of sand start to surface through and you'll never be able to get a perfectly smooth finish. Now, if you really want to get serious about sand casting, rather than using styrofoam, which vaporizes every time you pour your metal, look into green sand casting instead. It's about 90% sand, 5 to 10% clay, and then just a little bit of moisture to get it to a consistency where it'll hold together like a sand castle. The cool thing about green sand casting is you only have to make your model once, and then you can pack the sand down around it and then pull your model back out. You can reuse your model and your sand over and over and over again. Now, a lot of people ask me to try casting the foam fighter jets from a previous project, but there is a problem, and that's that the foam is not thick enough for the molten metal to get down inside. I've noticed with dollar store foam board, your object needs to be about two to three layers thick in order to get the molten metal into all the crevices. If it's less than too thick, your chances are very, very low that it's gonna fill all the gaps. Now let's talk about spalling. At certain times of the year, there's probably moisture held within the concrete. And if you ever spill your molten metal on the concrete, it can flash that moisture into steam in an instant and explode, spalling out bits of concrete all over the place. Now in my experience, these chunks of concrete fly up to about five feet away, which doesn't sound like much, but remember it's spewing molten metal at the same time. So if you're working over concrete, be very, very careful that you don't spill any molten metal. If you wanna be extra cautious, then do it in an area that's covered in sand. When I was making the mini master sword, I failed over and over and over again. Metal casting is an art form. It takes a lot of practice. You're not gonna get it right on the first try. It's just a lot of fun to get in there, get your hands dirty, see what works and see what doesn't. Play around with the materials that you've got and see what you can create. So there you have it guys. I actually am still a really big fan of the mini metal foundry after uh, two years of using it. I still use that one personally and I haven't made another system because it gets the job done and it works so well. And remember that this is an entry level system. If you wanna get really serious about backyard casting, I'd strongly recommend looking into proper refractory materials. You wanna be getting a refractory cement or KO wool. It's expensive, but it's really good stuff and it'll last a lot longer. The purpose of this project was to get you thinking outside of the box and seeing that you could do things on your own. And there are other ways to do it as well. My friend Nighthawk and Light just dug a hole in the ground and blew some air into it and that was enough to melt aluminum. The backyard scientist just put out a tutorial for making one of the simplest propane burners I've ever seen. Also check out The Art of Weapons. This is a kid who took refractory brick and made his own electric kiln for melting metals as well, which is very clean and uses electricity instead of propane or charcoal. So there you have it guys. There's a few tips and tricks that hopefully will help you in your backyard metal casting experiences. I hope you make something cool. 
What's up guys? It's that time of year where I'm starting to get the itch to get back into metalworking again. Now I went on Amazon to order a new clay graphite crucible, but apparently I ordered the wrong one because this thing is absolutely massive and way too big for my mini metal foundry. So I thought today might be a good opportunity to try making a larger metal foundry with a large metal pail and some proper refractory material so it lasts a bit longer. Now you could get a big bag of refractory cement, mix it up and cast it the same way we did with our plaster and sand mix, but today I wanted to try using kale wool. This stuff is a very flexible ceramic mat, and although it looks really flimsy, really fragile, and looks like it'll go up in flames, it is extremely temperature resistant. In fact, it's so well insulated that if I fire up one of my blow torches and shoot it straight at it, I can hold the other side without feeling any of the heat penetrate into it. So here's the basic idea for today. We're gonna take this metal bucket, we're gonna line it with kale wool, drill a couple of holes so our propane torches can fit down inside it, and then line the top of the pail with insulation so it can sit on top as a cover. The goal of today's experiment is speed, convenience, and a brand new metal foundry that can handle extreme temperatures and thermal shock. Let's get busy. Now I should be wearing a mask doing this, but I'm just gonna cut very slowly, very carefully, and take a risk. Now when dealing with kale wool, there are a couple of things you need to know. This stuff is extremely fibrous, and when you start cutting it, it'll put a kale wool dust into the air that's very, very bad for your lungs. If you breathe too much of this stuff in, it can cause long-term damage. So you can see I used a pair of scissors to cut the kale wool out in a circle about two inches in diameter wider than the lid itself. The thinking here is, is that'll give us a little extra room to cram it down into the lid so it holds into place a bit better. Let's we'll see if that's really the case. Hmm, it actually looks like that's gonna work. <laughs> Just gonna pad that down a little bit more, press it into place, and I think we may be in business. There we go. Got the lid all pressed into place, so let's move on to lining the bucket next. So here's what we managed to do so far. We have lined the lid with kale wool, we've lined the bottom and the sides of our steel bucket, and we cut off some more refractory material and shoved it down the bottom to act as a base for our crucible. At this point, all that's left to do is drill some holes. So, let's drill some holes. There we go. Exciting news guys, our foundry is ready for operation. We've got two holes in the sides that our propane torches can fit into. And you can see I've made these little wooden blocks here with a groove in the middle that are designed to hold the propane torches off the ground and in position. If you look down inside the foundry, you can see the two propane torches come in at opposite angles. And it's designed that way so when we light this thing up, it'll create a swirling hurricane of fire that'll get this thing roaring hot. At this point, we're pretty much ready to start melting down some metals, but there's one thing that we need to do first, and that's to temper our clay graphite crucible. You might remember from a previous video that if we just throw these things in raw and light them up, they have a tendency to break, crack, or explode. And I put way too much money into this crucible to allow that to happen. To make sure we do things right, we need to temper our clay graphite crucible. That means we're gonna put it in the foundry and slowly bring up the temperature over time until we can get it glowing red hot, and then we'll let it cool down on its own. Oh wow, that looks cool. You know what's cool is you can look down through the vent holes and actually see the crucible as well, so you can tell when it's ready. I have created fire. Fiery vortex of metal smelting power. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this thing will take down copper, no problem. So let's recap some of the things we learned here today. We found that you could take any steel container, line it with kale wool, and instantly make a high temperature backyard foundry. We also discovered this stuff is easy to cut and extremely lightweight. This entire contraption weighs less than 10 pounds. 
We also learned that kale wool is toxic if you breathe it in, so you do want to be wearing a dust mask if you ever try cutting it. And it's extremely itchy if it makes contact with your skin, so it's a good idea to wear long sleeves. That's pretty much it for this project, guys, and I'm very excited to see how well this thing performs in future metal casting experiments. Big shout out to my friend Jerem for donating this kale wool to me for free. I appreciate your donation, Jerem. I've put it to good use. What's up guys, welcome back. Thanks for joining us today on The King of Random. In the past, we've shown you how to make your very own backyard foundry using a metal bucket and this stuff called kale wool. Well, this has worked out great. We've used it for a whole bunch of different projects and today we're going to try and upgrade and build ourselves a larger foundry using this bigger 31 gallon trash can. The basic principle is that we have our metal trash can which will contain the heat nicely, but it's very conductive and would easily let the heat escape out into the air. So we have this stuff called kale wool, which is a very good insulator. It holds the heat in extremely well. In fact, you can put a blowtorch on one side of this and your hand on the other side won't even feel it. I don't think it's even warm after that. So that's the plan. We'll line the whole can with the kale wool. That way we'll have the metal container which contains everything and the kale wool will hold in the heat. Now that we know what we're going to do, let's get started. A quick note about the kale wool, it's a fibery substance, a lot like fiberglass, so it's very irritating if it gets on your skin, or especially if you breathe it in. So I'm going to be wearing a dust mask, and that's why I have this long sleeve shirt, so it doesn't make my arms all itchy. There we go, hopefully that'll keep me from breathing in too many fibers. As a first step, I want to add a lining at the bottom of our trash can. I'm going to set the trash can on top of the kale wool, and then trace around that. I'll cut that circle out, and that will go in the bottom of our can. All right, we've got our circle cut out. Now we're just gonna push that down into the bottom of our trash can. Now the kale wool is at the bottom of our trash can and that will insulate really well, but it's not a very stable surface if we wanna rest up on it. Here we've got some compressed ceramic fiber board that will work as a stable base. It's a type of board that insulates really well and since it's rigid, it should be better for standing things on than just the kale wool. Now I probably want to cut this just a little bit inside of where I marked because the very bottom of the trash can is just the tiniest bit wider than the inside bottom of the trash can, I suspect. So we'll have a little bit of play maybe if I cut it too small, but that'll still be better than having it be too big and not fitting. All right, there's a circle. That looks pretty good. Let's see if that fits in the bottom of our can. Ah, it's beautiful. There we go, a nice flat surface. That'll be much nicer than trying to balance stuff on unstable kale wool. All right, now we'll try and take our kale wool and line the entire inside of it. To figure out how much of this kale wool I'm gonna need, I'm just gonna put the whole roll down in the can and then I'll unroll it onto the sides as much as I can and then mark where I wanna cut it. Just sort of start with it one side there. Try and get it nice and pressed up against the sides. Of course, the trash can is not a perfect cylinder, so it is a little bit wider at the top than the bottom. I'm gonna try and account for that. All right, I'm gonna take my marker and mark. I'm gonna give myself some extra that I can later trim off as I do fine tuning without all the weight of the extra cable getting in my way in here. Just kind of mark that. Now, since the trash can is, like I said, very slightly tapered, ideally our kale wool would have a slight arc to it to fit perfectly around the edge. We're just gonna fake it a little bit by cutting one side at a bit of an angle, and I think we'll get a pretty good fit. So I did the rough cut before. So now I'm going to see if I can get that a little bit more refined. You can see that the edges are overlapping by quite a bit at this point. So this is where one side is, so I'm gonna mark that right there. And the other one is right here. And once again, I am gonna give myself a little bit extra because it's better for it to overlap some than for there to be gaps. All right, let's see how we did. Yeah, it is overlapping just a little bit, which like I said, is not a problem. Just take some squishing and persuasion. There we go, that's looking pretty good right there.
The main body of the can is lined, so now let's quickly cut out a piece the right size and shape for our lid. I wonder if a knife would be easier than scissors, so I'm just gonna try that and see if I like it any better. As you can see, I am leaving an inch wide gap. That's the same thing that we did with our smaller foundry. This way, when we push it into the lid, it will have a little bit of pressure on it and help hold it in place. There we go. Hmm, I don't think it's gonna compress enough with that extra border I left on it. This lid has an interesting shape to it. There's a lip that extends off of the edge. I think by adding an additional inch to what was already added by the lip, my KO wool is now too wide to fit inside the inner area of this circle. So I'm gonna cut it down just to where I measured it with the marker and see if it fits any better. All right, now we've got our slightly smaller circle. Let's see if that fits into our lid any better. Oh yeah. That's exactly what you want. Being pushed in a little bit, it's not so tight that it won't fit, but it's big enough that it's still got some pressure holding it in. Hey, that's what we're hoping for. And let's give it a try, throwing it on our can. Beautiful, that should be one insulated trash can at this point. Now we've got the walls and the lid covered in our insulating cable, and for now it's holding itself on really well. But with our mini foundry, over time, as it got heated up and cooled down and heated up and cooled down time after time, the KO wool lost some of its rigidity and began to slump a little bit. So I've got some hardware and I'm gonna use that to attach the wool to both the lid and the sides of the trash can a little bit so that down the road we don't run into that problem. The machine screw that I'm using here is a little longer than I need, so I might end up replacing it later. That should hold it up pretty nicely. Now I'm gonna do the same thing at three points on the lid. Now, no matter how much structural integrity this KO wool loses, it should hold itself on pretty well. It's attached. Now we've got a very well insulated trash can, but no way to add heat. So let's drill some holes into the sides and the lid so we have a place for the propane heat to go in and for some ventilation to go out. I'm gonna try and make the holes in our large foundry at the same height off the ground as the holes in our mini foundry. That way the wooden blocks that we use to support the burners will work at the same height. Plus if we have anything that's just on the bottom of our foundry, we'll know that it's getting the heat that it needs. That's smooth. Turns out a hole saw is not the very best tool for cutting through very thin steel. But it's what I've got, so let's try it on the other side. Oh, that actually almost went smooth. All right, just as an experiment, let's see if you try and use a hole saw on k -Wool, what happens. Still not perfectly, but much better. With those holes added, I think our full-size backyard foundry is ready to test with heat. Now I do have a concern that the spacing of the hose with these was designed with the mini foundry in mind, and I'm not positive they'll stretch out far enough to really angle the way we want them to on the large trash can. We'll see what we can do. I think we might be all right. All right, I did get both of them in and slightly angled, but as you can see, the hose is being pulled really tight, and I don't think it's gonna cause any problems for our test, but we'll probably want to add a little bit extra hose before we use this foundry for any extended amount of burning. Whew, that gets toasty quick. 
You can see that the burners aren't angled quite as much as they should be. That's partly because our hose isn't long enough. So while it is heating it up pretty well, it's not really circling around quite as much as we'd like it to. Let's throw the lid on and let this thing get really warm. turned off but I'm just gonna see oh ah ah that is toasty in there like the fire is not going but it's still just really really warm inside there there you go that is how to make a large-scale backyard foundry there are a few different things we're thinking of trying with this foundry it's obviously much larger than our normal backyard foundry which is gonna let us do a few more things with it we'll be able to fit a large crucible and we also might try firing some ceramics in this forge I also took some of our leftover cable and I relined the mini furnace and I was impressed at how easy it is to do that it only took me a couple minutes to completely replace the lining this is a great little furnace you can build and use and if the cable gets so old that it's falling apart it's very easy to replace in just a few minutes I'm really looking forward to trying out some experiments with our large foundry to see what it can really do. Thanks for joining us for this project and we'll see you in the next one. This is a type of brick made from a silica that is designed to withstand a lot of heat. This is very similar to the type of brick that is found inside kilns designed for firing ceramics and similar things. And we want to try and use this kind of brick to line and protect the inside of our foundry. Here's the basic idea. We'll draw up some patterns for the inside of this foundry and cut our fire bricks into shape so they fit nicely around the edges. We'll use KO wool to fill in any gaps and to line the lid. The KO wool will be attached to the lid using some stainless steel hardware. As with our previous designs, we'll have two holes in the sides and two holes in the top. Now I chose this bucket because it's a great size. It seems like it has a pretty solid handle on it and it's got a lid. All of those things are necessary. However, you can see that this bucket is black and that's not the normal color of the steel. This has been powder coated. That powder coating will burn off probably the first time we fire it up. So just to get ahead of things, we're gonna take a torch and burn it all off right now. It's not gonna look as pretty afterward, but it will work well. It's taking a while to burn all the paint off using our small propane torch. So what I'm gonna try is to drill the two holes that I know I need in the sides of my bucket, hook up the large propane tank, and then just let it burn with no insulation in there at all. That should heat the whole thing up really nicely and burn off all of the excess paint. And then we can continue on from there. I probably need to change the height of where our burners enter our furnace. In the past, we had a pretty thin bottom on here, and this time, I think we're gonna use a half of one of these bricks, which is gonna be about an inch and a half thick. So that's gonna stick up a little bit more than what we've used before. So I have a mark where it was before. Let's go up to about right there. While I'm cutting holes in metal, might as well cut the holes in the lid as well. It is probably inevitable that at some point this handle is going to burn up, but I might be able to prolong that just a little bit. This is going so much faster. I think we are just about there. Beautiful. Well, I mean, it's ugly, but how well it worked was beautiful. Now we just need to give this a few minutes to cool off. While our metal bucket is cooling down and before we clean it off to do the next steps, we're gonna take some of these fire bricks and cut them down. We want the bottom to be about half of one brick and the sides, we're gonna try and cut these bricks into thirds so we have about one inch slices. All right, I suspect this is going to make more dust than pretty much anything I've ever done before, so I'm going to do it outside and I'm gonna be wearing a dust mask. This fire brick is really fragile stuff. It's so full of air that it doesn't have nearly the structural strength of regular bricks, but one advantage of that is that you can cut it really easily with just a handsaw. 
just because you can cut it easily doesn't mean you can cut it well. So I have to be really careful to cut in nice straight lines or I'm gonna end up with two pieces that are wildly different thicknesses. Not bad. It's not 100% perfect, but that is pretty close to a nice flat base. I like it. Now we've got to cut two more bricks into thirds. This is a million times better in the shade. Now, in the past, when we've made these foundries, we have used a galvanized steel bucket, not one of these black powder-coated ones. And I was trying to switch to something that was steel, but not galvanized steel. Honestly, I'm not sure if this worked or not. The label just said that it was steel. It didn't specify whether it was or was not. The main reason is that galvanized steel puts off fumes that you really don't want to breathe in when it gets heated up too much. I always try and avoid the fumes when I've got my foundry running. I just like to stand upwind of it and not be breathing in whatever it's putting off. So I don't think that really affects one way or the other too badly. I just thought I would try and if I can get a non-galvanized steel one, I'd use that. We're going to be using these two bricks, which is one brick cut in half as the very base for our foundry. However, as you can see, they are larger than the base at the moment, so we need to trim them down. So to cut them down to just the right size, we're gonna measure the size of the bottom of our bucket trace a circle out that same size, place our bricks on top of that, and line up where we need to make some cuts so they fit nicely into the bottom of the bucket. Excellent. Let's go trim those corners. All right, let's see if this fits or if we need to do a little bit more trimming. Ah. Fits. That should give us a nice solid base. That will do a great job insulating heat and not go anywhere. This fire brick stuff should withstand quite a bit of stress testing. Now we do have a slightly slant walled bucket. So measuring the diameter of the height above the base gives us approximately 10 inches. Because now what we need to do is take our six one inch pieces of brick and cut those so that they will all fit down inside our bucket, providing some walls. You can see the idea of how we want these bricks to go, but they don't fit super nicely right now because they're just a little bit too wide in places. So we gotta figure out just how much to trim those to make them all fit nicely together. Shouldn't take too much trimming, I don't think. To get those measurements, instead of just cutting up actual pieces of brick, we're gonna trace out pieces of this foam with the same dimensions of one end of the brick and lay them out on this circle. That should let us see how much they overlap and what needs to be trimmed. By lining these six pieces up around in a circle, we can see how much overlap we have, and that gives us a pretty good idea of what we need to cut. You can see that by trimming off the corners of all six pieces, we should get something that fits nicely together and backs right up against the very edges of the bucket. So what we need to do is take down these long corners to match up with what we've cut out of the foam here. And to do that, I'm going to try using a belt sander. And boy, I thought sawing these was gonna be dusty. I think the belt sander is gonna put that to shame. We'll see how well it does. They may have gotten trimmed a little bit more than necessary, but they do all fit together, and I think we can make this work. We need to be able to pass our torch heads through two of the brick panels, one on each side. Let's cut those holes. I think it's time to add in our kale wool. We're gonna use that to fill in some of the gaps around the sides and hold the fire bricks just where we want them. And as I said, we'll use them to line the lid.
In the past, we've had our cable wool stuck to the lid using just friction, and that works pretty well for a while. As the cable wool degrades, it starts to get a little bit smaller and lose some of its structural integrity, at which point it starts just falling out. So as an upgrade, we're gonna do something like we did with our giant metal foundry, and we're gonna use some stainless steel hardware to hold that all in place. Now I have an idea for how I want this to go, and I'm actually going to install these bolts with the head down inside of the lid. And my goal is to sort of make a couple of little feet that I can have sticking down on the bottom so when I remove the lid off of the foundry, I can just set it down and the bolts will just hold it off of the ground. Hey, that's standing. All right, let's see if this works. Now those might be long enough at this point that they hit the fire brick inside, but if they are, we can just adjust them so they're shorter. Ooh, I think that works out nicely. Fits within the KO wall barrier and does not quite reach the brick. So we've now got a lid, it goes down on. The KO wall should be able to stay on even after it gets old and starts losing some of its integrity. And when we want to remove our lid, we can just set it down and it stays off of the ground. The K wall doesn't hit the dirt. I don't have to worry about flipping it over and being quite so careful with it. I can just set it down and let it hold itself up. We've got the bricks lining the bottom and the sides. We've got K wall holding the bricks right where we want and insulating the top. I think all that we need now is to test this bad boy. Let's get some propane going around in it, see how it does. I like that feature. Of course, the real test is going to be seeing how well this holds up over time. I'm pretty sure that the bricks are gonna do a better job than just K wool of staying intact and not starting to fall to pieces. Guys, one of the biggest, most famous projects that Grant ever created for this channel was the Backyard Metal Foundry. He searched far and wide to figure out how we could make a foundry that we could build ourselves and could actually melt some metal down. What he came up with was a metal bucket with various types of heat insulation and reinforcement on the inside. Over the years, there's been several iterations and our most recent one that had the fire bricks and the little bit of the KO wool up at the top finally met its end after, oh man, how many times did we use that? A lot, that thing was around for a while. It was, and so it is time to honor the original design and add in all of the upgrades we've been able to come up with. Grant was always thrilled to see how his design could be taken to the next level. So that's what we're trying to do today. We're still using the steel bucket. We're still gonna be using the bricks and the K wool, but we are adding onto it. We're gonna see if we can make one level better than we've ever made before. So we've got our six gallon steel bucket, and this is just from Home Depot. Comes with the lid, and of course we're gonna be modifying the lid as well. But pretty much every part of this process is very messy, so we're gonna head outside with it and start making that mess. <laughs> All right, as one of the primary sources of insulation, we are going to be using these fire bricks again. If you're trying to find these, I recommend searching for insulated fire brick. As bricks go, they're fairly lightweight, so the lack of density is actually a lot of what gives it its insulation. You know, air doesn't travel through it well, and uh, it doesn't conduct heat right through the solid parts of the material. We found that worked really well, I thought. It does. The problem is, is it's a little too thick. It is. We wouldn't really be able to fit any of those in there and then still have space for anything. So we get to do a lot of cutting. We're going to cut these bricks into thirds, and then we're going to shape them a little bit to make them fit nicely into our bucket. So we've got our fire brick for the bottom. Like last time, what we're going to do, we're going to take one of these fire bricks. We're going to cut it in half. That's going to go down at the bottom of here. And then we're going to cut some more bricks into thirds. And those are going to be what will line the sides. If you're doing this, it will probably dull your saw blade quite a bit. I went and got a cheap saw. This was like six bucks. And I don't think it'll be good for much other than cutting fire brick by the time I'm done. <laughs> even start shaping them yeah all right I got marked off approximately where the edges of the bucket are this is the outside of course so I am gonna take it in about that far that should be the bottom 
All right, let's check this is fitting. Oh uh, yeah. That fits, as you can see, there is a little bit of a gap. Uh, and part of that is just because of the dimensions of bricks versus the dimensions of the bucket. Part of it is because the bucket is tapered and so it's really close to the walls at the bottom, but even just one inch up, the gap grows a little bit. And so we're gonna use some KO wool and we have some refractory cement and we're going to use some of this as well to, to line pretty much everything. This is gonna be used to hold bricks in place and to cover up the edges of the KO wool in the bucket, which should make it last longer and be safer in general. Now, as these are right now, if I recall correctly, we can't quite fit them all. Maybe we actually can. This one's looking a bit bigger. This, this bucket might not be quite the same size as the last one, and so if actually, we can... Actually, we yeah. might need them. No, no, we got them all. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is nice. Yeah, this bucket is just a pinch wider than the one we used for our last one, so I don't think we're gonna have to cut down the sides of the bricks like I did, which is gonna be good, because that way these can even rest sideways a little bit, and we'll have a lot more access to getting whatever it is we're heating up yeah, down within. Room. I think what we're gonna want is, yeah, cable sort of like triangle slivers mm -hmm. and then just Very a strip around, around the, top. the top. But also in this section, I'm thinking back behind it, just like if we can slice it in half like we did with the bricks. It peels, yeah. Yes, yeah, so let's peel it in half and do some very thin pieces. So we'll adhere some pieces of cable onto the back, place the bricks, and then we'll put triangular pieces in between every single one so that that way it's double insulated with the K-Wool and then we've got the bricks closest to the flame. K-Wool is ceramic, not glass. So while you don't want to breathe it, touching it's not gonna do anything to you. All right, I've made sort of a wedge with a slight distal taper going down and I think this will fit pretty nicely in between the bricks. So I just gotta make five more of these. Uh, I think this way it'll just kind of- Oh, fantastic, yeah. Right in between, filling gaps pretty nicely. So yeah, I think I'll just try good. and make five of those. Now this cement, from what I understand, is pretty special because it is a little bit different than regular cement. It's actually much denser and much better for heat. So we're scaling this down just a little bit. This is a 55 pound bag. It would need five pounds of water technically, but we don't need that much. So what we're gonna do is we're actually scaling it down to about 11 pounds. We'll see how much that makes. We should be good with that. Aha! Five and a half pounds. All right, so now I'm going to toss some gloves on. So that's technically all the water we're using. We have added more water than the instructions call for. We're a little concerned about how much this is going to shrink as it dries. I think it's going to be okay. We are doing things a little bit differently than what this might actually normally be used for. So we're gonna let this dry for several days before we try and heat this up. Patching a couple little gaps in here. I think we're ready to start adding it on. Nice. So I'll just start at the bottom and work our way up, going for maybe a half inch thick layer, maybe a little less even. I think less, especially with the amount that we've got here. That's true. Definitely meant for cutting thicker pieces of metal. Oh my gosh, fantastic. Oh yeah. That's yeah. gonna be The perfect. cable is resting like right on the cement. So that should be giving us a pretty good seal. So that just these are our gaps. That's where the air comes out. Perfectly controlled. And then as before, our screws also work as little feet to keep it up off the ground a little bit. Yeah, and we wanna make sure it's good and cured and then we have to do a slow heat. So you may have noticed there aren't holes drilled into the foundry yet. We've made sure we know just where the bricks are. So we are gonna drill those same holes using our same hole saw. We're gonna wait until this is cured so we can cut through the metal and then the brick and then the concrete all kind of at once. That'll be our feed. And that'll just be when the concrete is dry. And after we do that, we'll hook the propane up. We might just only turn one burner on and just slowly get that heating until we can hopefully get this to cure nice and evenly. Like a lot of water will cure and evaporate, 
but chemically there will still be water inside until we heat it up to that higher temperature, but we have to get there slowly so it doesn't crack. So now it's time to just wait for a bit and we'll come back later, finish it up. It's been several days and our, uh, our cement is nice and dry, just as we were hoping. We think that all of the water has escaped from it, at least from a traditional level. However, we do of course need to add heat to really blast it out of there at a chemical level. So it's basically like firing clay, it's just cement. We're basically just driving the water out of it. Right now, however, there's nowhere to put our gas jets in. We need to add <laughs> holes. So we've got our hole saw. We're gonna use this, we're gonna try and very carefully cut through. Hopefully it goes well without causing destruction. This is basically every different style that you and Grant have tried, but we've combined them all into what we hope is like a super foundry. So this should be the brick that we're trying to get through. Right about there is gonna be the center. Now I am actually going to move over just a little bit because I'm gonna angle this and try and go in not quite 90 degrees perpendicular to the bucket, but just a little bit angled because we like to have the jets angled as they're going into the bucket. All right, got our pilot hole started. There we go. I'd say our aim is doing pretty good. It looks like we're quite well lined up with the middle of the brick. I think we are through the brick now and uh, onto the cement. I think the brick is thick enough that it's stopping our drill from pushing all the way through. So I'm gonna try and get a screwdriver or a chisel to break out some of the brick that I've drilled at least partially through to see if I can get a little more clearance. Well, this stuff is a lot harder than I was expecting to get through. I'll keep going, see if I get anywhere. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to start drilling the hole in the other side because it's possible that what I'm doing now is going to ruin my bit and I want to make sure I can at least get through the metal on the other side while the bit still has some cut to it. Well, I was uh, concerned about whether or not I would still be able to get through this metal and I was right to be concerned. I have basically wrecked this hole saw for cutting through metal at this point by trying to cut through cement. So. It's taken me like five times as long to do not even the entire job of cutting through the metal on this side. So I may have to make a quick stop at the hardware store to buy a new one of these. I think I can still get through this with this, but to get through the rest of that cement, I'm going to have to figure out what tool to use. They may have something specifically designed for that at the hardware store, and that's what I'm gonna check out. We've gone and got ourselves a new hole saw. This one, although it doesn't look or feel very sharp, actually has diamond in it. So it's designed for cutting through masonry. Should be able to get through our cement without too much trouble. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> that is fantastic. Man, right tool nice for the job. Aim. Right tool for the job. There you Don't go. Don't use a metal saw to cut through cement. <laughs> it's just not gonna do it. All right, so now we've got the holes in it. It's time to heat this up. Yes. Awesome. Let's get all our gas hooked up, and I'm thinking we're gonna start with the lid off, only one burner open. Okay. So it's just barely going minimum heat. We'll let that run for 10, 15 minutes till it gets up to a good heat, then maybe put the lid on, slowly turn the heat up, open the second burner, just slowly bring this heat up to get this to its cure temperature. Okay, this has been running for about two hours, gradually increasing the heat, and we have a nice orange glow it on looks pretty much the entire inside right now, which is just what we're hoping for. Fantastic. So yep. I think it's time we can kill the gas. Take, Take a look at it. Oh, oh, look at that. that. Is, wow, okay, the radiating heat. <laughs> as soon as that, <laughs> like we've had warm foundries, like our foundries are always very warm when you take the lids off, but this like, it was kind of chilly and then all of a sudden that came off and the whole thing is warm. That is amazing. At this point, this is finished. So we have our new updated foundry. I think Grant would be proud of this one. I think so.